It's an honor, player, and privilege to have Scott Thornbury for this webinar today with us. Scott Thornbury lives in Spain and, and recently started on an online MIT school program for the new school in New York. His writing credits include several awards and books for teachers on language and methodology. He is also the series editor for the Cambridge Handbooks for Language Teachers and the trustee of the Hands Up Project. You can find out more about him at his website www.scottthornbury.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Thornbury for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amanala. And uh, thank you for this second opportunity to talk to your uh, enormous. Uh, following and let me congratulate you again on your uh, enterprise. I, I really like what you're doing and I'm very impressed with the range of speakers you've had and the quality of the talks that I've watched uh, on YouTube. So once again, thank you, Amanala, and continue the good work. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's lovely to see you all here. I see some familiar names in the audience. Uh, that excites me, but some of you will have heard some of this before, but clearly you <laughs> uh, want to hear it again. Uh, I'm going to talk on the subject of dogma frees the spirit. And uh, I just want to look at the word spirit for a moment. Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, the, we know that the literal meaning of spirit, the dictionary meaning, is the kind of Im immaterial part of our human uh, presence. But uh, it has other meanings, too, that are associated with it metaphorically. We can talk about, for example, a particular spirit being the, uh, the beliefs, the values, the aspirations of a community, you know, we talk about a community, good community spirit. We talk about, for example, the spirit of the Labour Party, or it's against the spirit of the Labour Party, and so on. So this is the kind of the communal aspirations, beliefs, and values meaning. Uh, and then it has another meaning, and, and you get it in the sense of uh, they played the game with great spirit. Yeah, so here we mean kind of energy, liveliness, uh, a spirited performance. The family is showing great spirit despite the tragedy that befell them, etc. So I want to tease out those, those, different, those two different meanings. The meaning of spirit as the aims, beliefs, values of a community, and the spirit as the liveliness and the energy. And I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, and incidentally, there is no, there are no uh, slides because it would be against the spirit of what I want to say to you. So do take notes. Uh, and if you have any questions, throw them into the chat and I shall endeavor to answer them as we go along. So what I want to do is I want to look at this first meaning of spirit in relation to our profession. What is the spirit of language teaching? What is the spirit of English language education. Uh, and this involves going back a little bit in history. And this is a selective collection of, I think, fundamental ideas, which to me embody the spirit of language education. And one of them goes back a very long time. And many of these ideas have been borrowed from mainstream education. They will be familiar to you, uh, even if you're not a, an English language teacher. And I want to talk, first of all, about experiential learning, the notion of learning through experience. Uh, 
And this is an idea that goes way back to people like John Dewey at the end of the 19th century, the, the notion of learning through doing. And it was very much a feature of what have become known as progressive education movements uh, in, this, in the succeeding uh, decades and centuries even. The idea that if you learn by doing, it makes a greater impression on you, you learn more, uh, and it is immediately related to what you will have to do with that knowledge in the real world. And so various forms of this involve, for example, Maria Montessori schools where children learn through play, which is a form of doing, where uh, people, um, one progressive school in France many years ago, uh, set up or imported a printing press into the school. This is pre-computer technology. So that the students could create and print their own books, poems, plays, etc. So this is a very much fundamental, as I say, principle involved in progressive education. The idea that we learn best through doing, through experience, experiential learning. And of course, you can see this, how it impacts on our own field with the advent of the communicative approach. The communicative approach, which dates back to the 1970s, uh, was very much premised on the idea that you learn a language by using it. Yeah, you don't learn a language by reading about it in a grammar book. You don't learn a language by memorizing all the words in the dictionary. You learn a language by using it. This is by using it, not you learn a language and then you use it. No, you learn a language by using it. So the communicative approach placed a priority on communication. That's why it's called the communicative approach. Uh, so communicating with whatever means, and that's the important thing. You don't wait until you're at B2 level to commu communicate. You're communicating from the day you enter the classroom. And through those little conversations, language learning evolves. And we'll, go, we'll explore that idea a little bit later on. So this was, as I say, the fundamental premise behind the communicative approach. You learn a language by using it. So it's very much consistent with the notion of experiential learning. Although I have to say, you won't find many references to experiential learning in the early literature about the communicative approach. And as we know, the communicative approach has evolved in different ways and different forms over the 50 years or so since it was first uh, proposed. And one of its, what we might call stronger forms is the idea of task-based learning and task-based learning when you think about that that is experiential learning it's learning through doing tasks not learning the language and then doing the task but learning the language through doing the task doing the task for example and then getting support while you're doing the task or after you're doing the task doing the task again etc but the cycle starts with communication with the task Task-based learning, project-based learning, activity-based learning, it comes under a number of different labels. And of course, we go back to some of the first proponents of task-based learning in the 1970s, including N.S. Prabhu in Southern India, uh, who applied the notion of task-based learning in the secondary school where he was teaching, he and his colleagues were teaching. As, at the round about the same time, historically, a parallel movement was developing and particularly, well, I wouldn't say particularly in the United States, but parts of Europe and the United States, which was a kind of reaction against the current educational model, which was very much, if you think about it in language teaching terms, it was very much about pattern practice drilling, drilling focused on accuracy, and a focus on, uh, going further back, if we look at grammar translation, a focus on learning the facts of the language in the hope that once you've internalized these facts, they will somehow magically turn into competence, proficiency. And there was a growing belief that the whole educational model was 
far too narrow and it focused purely on you know the cognitive functions the mental functions of the learner and didn't take into account them of their whole person existence not just their minds but their emotions their experiences their wishes their fears etc and so we got the development of what is now called humanistic education whole person learning with an emphasis not just as i say on the cognitive but on the affective the emotional as well and with the view that uh, the learners should be more involved and responsible for the learning process and here we get out of that developed the notion of learner centered teaching learner centered teaching very popular notion in the 1980s, 1990s. And of course, it led to the development of the learner autonomy movement, the idea that learners could take more responsibility for their own learning. So you get under various names, learner directed or self-directed learning. The idea that given the, given the tools, given the strategies, given the skills, given the techniques, learners could take more responsibility for their own learning, not just outside the class, but actually in the classroom. So we got, as I say, the development of the notion of learner autonomy. And learner autonomy is not an all or nothing idea. It's a graduated process where learners achieve a degree of self-direction through guidance from the teacher, training and particular skills and strategies, and it's not, as I say, a, a case of just throwing them into the deep end and asking them to get on with it. We've got various forms of that have emerged over time. We've got the notion of minimally intrusive education, as proposed by Sugata Mitra, another uh, Indian academic now working in the UK, who has uh, proposed a model of education which, in a sense, erased the teacher altogether and put all the responsibility on the learners. And I think intuitively, uh, I'm sure you feel that this is a rather extreme leap. Yeah, teachers needs to be there as the guide on the side, uh, if not the sage on the stage as in traditional teaching. So the learner centered, the notion of learner centered teaching combined with the no notion of the communicative approach was an extremely powerful idea and fueled a lot of interesting developments in the late 20th century in education and in language education. In parallel, uh, there was a movement in education which uh, we now call critical pedagogy, developed initially in Brazil by Paulo Freire, teaching literacy skills to um, farm workers in Brazil by building lessons out of the content of the lived lives of the students, of the learners, yeah? ignoring the prescriptions from the Ministry of Education, the course books, the grammar, the syllabus, et cetera, but going straight into the lives of the learners and using that material, this learner-generated content, as it's now called, to build the learning experience, to co collaboratively build the learning experience through, for example, having learners uh, exchange uh, stories, accounts, experiences of their working life, but also building into that a degree of critique, this is the critical pedagogy, where they problematized, where they thought about their working lives and discussed them and talked about how these could be better using the language that they're learning. So this is the critical aspect of critical pedagogy. In the words of uh, one writer on critical pedagogy, uh, Roger Simon, way back in 1992, said the dialogue, this dialogue in which the students and teachers are to participate together is always grounded in the realities of the lived relations within which 
the participants find themselves. That is to say, this conversation is about their lives, the things that matter to them, the things that concern them, the things that please them, the things that worry them. Uh, and this is not just, you know, a classroom conversation in the traditional or the, the sense that we might know it, where we just chat about the weekend. Uh, it's enmeshed in every aspect of their life. And this is the, again, that the, in a sense, the ideological, the political agenda underpinning critical pedagogy. But whether or not you buy into the notion of critical pedagogy as transformative in that sense, nevertheless, the notion of dialogic teaching has been very, very important in the history of education generally. Uh, and a, it was a kind of offshoot, if you like, of Paolo Freire's dialogic model of critical pedagogy. Dialogic teaching, sometimes called dialogic inquiry or instructional conversation, uh, developed out of studies of how learners, children, transition from the home into the school. And traditionally, that's a big jump. They go from having conversations with their parents, with their siblings, for example, to going into a situation where learning is, in a sense, fed into them yeah, in this kind of traditional transmissive model. I am the teacher. I'm going to tell you about the subject, whether it's geography, whether it's mathematics, whether it's science, whether whatever, or whether it's language. And this is such a big jump for children that they, many of them fail at that jump. Now, they're not prepared for this transition from learning through doing in their first five or six years of their lives, learning through conversation into being these kind of empty vessels being filled with knowledge. And so what developed was the notion of a dialogic, ped, uh, a dialogic pedagogy, dialogic inquiry, if you like, where, again, using the experience, using the history and the principles of experiential learning, children were given tasks to do, projects to do, which were supported, moderated, overseen by the teacher, but whether learning developed collaboratively in groups of students doing these particular tasks or activities. But very important is the role of the teacher here, the teacher as the scaffolder, yeah, providing the kind of safe structure within which the learners could take these first steps into understanding subject matter knowledge through doing things. So there, a there's a tension here between, if you like, conversation, which is what the students are doing, essentially, they're talking to each other, and instruction, which is what the teacher is doing, taking advantage of things that come up in these conversations to make some kind of instructional point. Now, but not starting with the instructional point, letting the instructional point emerge out of the task. Uh, one writer talks about this as the classroom may be viewed as an ecological environment in which lesson, on the one hand, the lesson, the syllabus, the curriculum, and conversation are relational to each other. They support each other, needing one another for ecological balance. And this is, again, you can see from the point of view of language learning, is an important idea where the learners are if nothing else, speaking more, collaborating more, participating more, there's more chance that they will learn the language through using it. And therefore, it fits very neatly into the notion of communicative language teaching and also task-based learning. So that is the kind of the dialogic, if you like, uh, as opposed to the transmissive model of education, the tra traditional transmissive model, which is good morning class today, open your books. Today, we're going to learn the present perfect continuous. The present perfect continuous is formed like this, blah, 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 is used to mean this, blah, 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 blah. Now do the exercises in the book and we'll see if you've learned it. And there was 
considerable doubt uh, expressed by educationalists as to whether this was the uh, most effective way of learning anything, let alone a second language. Somehow sort of related to that uh, was the, uh, the notion that all learning is in some sense situated. It's contextualized. It takes place in a social context. Even if the social context is the classroom, there's nothing wrong with that. We all know that classrooms develop their own social norms, customs, traditions, etc. As people get to know each other, the dynamic inevitably, not inevitably, but hopefully improves and provides a ripe context or platform for learning, for doing things with language. The notion of situated learning uh, comes from the work of uh, two educationists, Lave and Wenger in the 1990s, who proposed what they called a participation model of education, as opposed to an acquisition or an internalization model. You know, we talk about second language acquisition as if the second language was out there and somehow we acquired it. It is internalized. And their view was no, learning is a collaborative process of participation in a community of practice. Community of practice was one of the key words, uh, terms in their educational model. So they say, in contrast with learning as internalization and memorization and all that kind of thing, learning as increasing participation in communities of practice concerns the whole person acting in the world. So we have a, a key term there again, the whole person referencing back to whole language learning, holistic learning, humanistic approaches. It's the whole person in the world, situated in the world, even the, the slightly artificial world, if you like, of the language classroom. So situated learning is a big idea in the history of the recent history of education. Not that recent, as I say, it emerged in the 1990s, but it has been developed uh, in a number of interesting ways, particularly in language teaching, uh, with the notion of um, fusing it with the with the notion of ecological learning. Learning it it takes place in a particular kind of eco ecology, where the learners ideally are exposed to what are called opportunities or affordances in the environment, in the environment of the classroom, but also in the real world. And here we have the notion of language learning in the wild. Uh, and this is a more recent idea, but it is consistent with the idea of situated learning. When you go outside the classroom, and take advantage of the learning opportunities there. Now, of course, that's not always going to be possible. There's an interesting movement in Scandinavia where people, adults, who go to study languages like Swedish or Icelandic enroll in a language school, but half the program takes place outside the classroom. They go into the city, they go into shops, they have exchanges, they record the exchanges on their phones. They do this collaboratively. They bring the recordings back to the class, they discuss it, they improve it, they go back into the street and so on. So you've got this kind of to and fro between the traditional, more traditional classroom and language learning in the wild. Now, as I say, that's not always possible. Although with technology now, we know that it is possible for learners to access, particularly with English, to access a great deal of English outside the classroom, in which of course they do when they're watching uh, YouTube, videos, streaming, movies, and so on. It's in a sense a form of going into the wild, if you like, for which, of course, they need the requisite preparation and help. And related to that is the notion that language learning is not just situated, but it's embodied. And this comes back to the whole person thing. We're not just computers walking around, you know, <laughs> And a human body. We are, we can, when we communicate, we communicate with all possible means, with our voice, with our eyes, with our hands, with the proximity, etc. 
And that language learning, particularly uh, pronunciation, is an extremely physical skill. And we neglect that at our peril. So bringing, doing activities in the classroom which allow learners to use their whole body, even if it's just standing up, it's going to be better if they're just slumped at a desk doing an exercise from the book. Um, which, of course, as we all know, uh, is one of the challenges of online teaching. How do you how do you create that physicality, the immediacy that comes with uh, embodiment, embodied language use? How do you get that degree of uh, engagement that comes from real uh, lang using <laughs> language in its context of use? And this is something that we had to work hard to recreate online. So that, just to summarize then, this is, these are some of the ideas which I feel are, are important when we talk about the spirit of education and of language education. And I'll just run through them again. The notion of experiential learning, the communicative approach, yeah, learning through using, task-based learning, which was an extension of the communicative approach, humanistic education, that is to say, whole person learning, including not just the mind, but also the emotions and the experiences of the learners, leading to learner-centered learning, where the learners take more control, more responsibility of their learning, where they are self-directed, and where their content in the lesson is often generated by the learners. And then critical pedagogy, the notion that the conversations in the classroom need to be more than simply passing the time of day, that the conversations need to problematize their lives, their worlds, their aspirations. And then the notion of related to that of dialogic teaching, teaching through scaffolding, teaching through interaction, teaching through conversation. Now where the teacher has a key role in providing the kind of support, the linguistic support that helps the learners even at very low levels, achieve a degree of conversational fluency. And then learning is situated, the notion of situated learning and learners uh, being in the world and not just as a mind, but being embodied, that language use is embodied and therefore should be learned as much as possible through physical, just as much as mental activity. So that, to me, these summarize what I see as the spirit of education. And I want to now map onto that my own particular, um, I wouldn't say contribution, but my, the way that I've, in a sense, tried to weave these different threads into a, an approach which is, I feel, appropriate for language teaching in a variety of contexts. And of course, you know this as dogma, hence the name of the talk, dogma, D-O-G-M-E, uh, which was an idea that me and a few colleagues developed in the uh, late 20th century and wrote about in the year 2000 initially. It was the idea that the communicative approach, which had been around at that time for 25 years, was somehow being, I wouldn't say betrayed, but it was being decaffeinated by an excess of grammar-focused materials uh, enshrined typically in your classroom course book. Now, it was... I should uh, underline the fact here that this was not uh, an anti-course book idea, but it was the way that course books had, in a sense, reverted to the traditional grammar syllabus. The traditional grammar syllabus encourages a style of teaching which is more transmissive than dialogic. If your syllabus has a has it as its central thread, a list of grammatical structures, you are inclined, whether you like it or not, to go in and teach those grammatical structures in a way which, in a sense, is against the spirit 
of education, against the spirit of experiential learning, against the spirit of whole person learning, against the spirit of dialogic teaching, against the spirit of situated and embodied learning. It's a return to, good morning class, open your books, page 56, present continuous, present continuous is form, et cetera. So what we tried to do, uh, based on our own experience as teacher trainers particularly, was to try and sort of save, to rescue what we felt were the important principles underlining the communicative approach. That is to say, you learn a language through using it. And if you're going to use a language, the syllabus should be organized around its uses, not around its grammatical structures. We don't you know, we don't intentionally use the present perfect continuous when we speak in real life. We say, oh, I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to use the present perfect continuous. No, that's not how we have conversations. How we have conversations is that we meet somebody and say, ah, haven't seen you, haven't seen you for ages. What have you been doing? Yeah, we use the structure for a communicative purpose. So why not organize our syllabuses around these semantical communicative purposes? That was the whole point of the community of approach when it was the first um, proposed in the 1970s. By the 1980s, that had all been thrown out the window and we were back to traditional grammatical syllabus. So what we were trying to do with what we call the dogma movement was to rescue the communicative approach and to rescue all these other principles that I've talked about, which seem to be consistent with the communicative approach. And to do that, we suggested that maybe we don't need so many materials in the classroom. What we might need is to create some space in the classroom. If we think of the classroom as a mini world, a mini ecology, a social structure, what we need to do is free that structure. We need to create the conditions where learners are participating rather than simply receiving knowledge. They are participants in a community of practice. So we suggested that fewer materials, more communication. That was all. That was it. It was based on an analogy with a film movement in Scandinavia. And if you don't know about it, it's not even worth knowing because it's finished. The film movement's finished, but dogma ELT <laughs> Uh, seems to have uh, amazing staying power. Why? Well, that's another question. We can come back to that in a minute. So what we proposed, and we proposed it in this book, which was called Teaching Unplugged, which we wrote in 2009, was that this so-called dogma approach needs to be, thank you, Amir, it needs to be uh, conversation-driven, yeah? communication at the beginning, at the outset, not just did you have a nice weekend, now turn to page 56. No, communication which becomes learner-generated content, which the teacher scaffolds and out of which the teacher finds instructional affordances. That was the first tenet, if you like, the first principle of the teaching unplugged, conversation-driven. I would extend that a little bit to say text-driven because conversation means speaking, but it could be written text too, text that the students create, create collaboratively, for example. The second principle, of course, that is, if it's going to be conversation driven, it's going to be materials light. You don't need a lot of materials to start a conversation. Anybody who's traveled on a long distance flight knows that when you're sitting next to a stranger, you can create a conversation without first checking that they know the present perfect continuous. And very importantly, the third principle that we outlined in the book was that the focus should be on the language that emerges out of these conversations, out of these texts that the students create, not pre-selected from a syllabus of grammatical points. Yeah? Because where there's a need, there's more likely to be learning. Yeah? You create the need and then you teach to that need. But if I say today, I'm going to go in and teach them the third conditional, why? Why? Did anybody ask for it? Did anybody use it? Did anybody try to use it and fail? Yeah. What is the need, the immediate need for the third conditional? But 
if they're doing a task where they're talking about things in the past that they wish hadn't happened, then there's a need. Then you can drop it in, yeah? Drop it in. I mean, it's not as easy as that, I know, but experienced teachers know how to create a space in the conversation say, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's have a look at that. Let's, and so on. Or after the task, yeah? Go back, review it and say, well, that was great, but you could have said this, yeah? And it won't always be grammatical. In fact, where most learners uh, come up against a problem, it's more likely to be lexical than grammatical. And so you'll be teaching just as much vocabulary, including useful formulaic language, as you will traditional grammatical structures. So those are the three principles of the um, so-called dogma or teaching unplugged approach. And what I would like to, what I'm trying to argue here is that these principles are consistent with the spirit of language teaching education, the spirit of language teaching education in the sense that it is our shared beliefs, values, and aspirations. That is the spirit. But by doing so, we free the spirit, the spirit in the sense of liveliness, animation, motivation. When learners are given the, the chance, the opportunity to contribute to the content of the curriculum, even if it's only five minutes in a lesson, they are released momentarily from the role of being empty vessels. And they're suddenly human beings. The spirit has been freed. So this is my argument. Uh, I think I mean, in a sense, that's as much as I need to say. I think we've got a good amount of time to look at uh, your own um, questions, dilemmas, doubts. So I'm just going to scroll back through the chat here, and uh, Manala is going to help me if I miss anything. Uh, and we've already got a question here from BJ, who asks, how do we assess language learning in a dogma approach? And that's a really good question because assessment, as we all know, is the kind of the tail that wags the dog. However much we want to try things out in the classroom, which focus on fluency, that focus on uh, the learner's content, etc. We still have, at the end of the day, we have the test, we have the assessment, we have the examination. And it's a big it's a toilet. We cannot ignore that. We cannot ignore that. We ignore that at our peril because, of course, institutions want us to test. Parents want us to test. Employers want us to test. But this has always been a problem anyway with the communicative approach. How do you test communication? Uh, or with a task-based approach? How do you test fluency, for example? How do you test uh, the ability of the learners to interact, to use language creatively. And it's not an insuperable problem. It's not as easy as testing inert grammar knowledge. You can uh, test inert, that is deactivated grammar knowledge through multiple choice tests. People have been doing that since the beginning of time. You can test grammatical knowledge for getting students to translate sentences backwards and forwards in, from their own language into English. That's what we've been doing for the beginning of time. Communicative testing is testing communication. It's just testing performance. Performance, yeah, not knowledge. And because I know that if I test your knowledge, you may get 100%. But if I have a conversation with you, you can't even begin. Yeah? So what's the way of testing performance? Well, it's getting students to perform. It's getting them to do something with the language. And it might just be something like, I'm going to, while the rest of the class are doing the exam, I'm going to take out one of you at a time and we're going to have a short conversation. Or I'm going to take two of you out at a time and I'm going to show you a picture and you're going to ask and answer each other questions about it. And I will evaluate your communicative competence. And I will evaluate your communicative competence because I have a list of criteria 
which are not, you know, watertight. It's a lot of subjectivity involved. That's inevitable. I mean, even as um, even we're evaluating the language abilities of people who speak our own language, we know that some people are more fluent than others, etc. We just feel it. But if we have a set of criteria, and these criteria exist now in documents like the Common European Framework, which have benchmarks for every level of the Common European Framework across a huge range of skills and competences. It's, it's not easy, it's messy, but if we know, if the learners know that at the end of the year, that part of the exam at least is going to be to test their communicative competence through some kind of task, perhaps they will pay more attention, they will work harder, they will be more engaged in those activities we do in the classroom, which prepare them for that kind of task. For writing, it's a lot easier. You just say, okay, rather than uh, complete all these sentences to see if I you know the grammar, I want you to write 100 words about the most enjoyable holiday you ever had. Off you go. And you can learn a lot you know, from the learner's ability to do that. Give them a choice of topics, perhaps. Uh, but just free writing of that. Again, you need a set of criteria. And the criteria should not be accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. It should be the ability, include the ability to be coherent, to communicate an idea, to be creative with the language uh, and so on. So yes, I'm not underestimating the, as I say, the backwash effect of testing, but I think the problem uh, is, has been addressed already by uh, people have looked at uh, how you test communication. Um, I'm just going back. Uh, oh. so, so I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, so someone from Indonesia, a cool from Indonesia asked that uh, dogma approach doesn't mean you don't create a lesson plan prior to teaching. Is that right? It's a different kind of lesson plan. I think it's a more uh, fluid lesson plan. It's not like uh, the lesson begins at 11. At 11, uh, uh, one minute past 11, I'll ask them about their weekend. At two minutes past 11, I'll ask them to open their books. At three minutes past 11, I'll teach them the present perfect continuous. At seven minutes past 11, we'll practice it. No, it's much more fluid. You allow a degree of flexibility because, you know, unless you do, these spontaneous moments of learner-generated content are not going to happen. So the, le the lesson plan needs to build that in. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And you go on. Yeah. And as teachers, we're good at that. We're very good at coping with the unexpected. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> when I first started teaching in Egypt, uh, teaching in the evening was always uh, a challenge because we'd lose the electricity constantly. The lights would go out. So you couldn't guarantee that you could play them a recording on the cassette, remember cassette records, or that you could do anything that involved them seeing the board, et cetera. So you learn to become, you learn to improvise. And as all, all teachers do that, they learn that. Uh, and that is sometimes, you know, the best skill you can ever learn as a teacher is the, the, the skill of improvising, of being spontaneous, of being responsive, responsive teachers as opposed to responsible, well, I would say responsive teachers are responsible teachers. But coming back to the question about the lesson plan, the lesson plan is just a blueprint, a kind of route map, but it may not end up where I expected it to go. That's not the end of the world. Just because we don't get to the present perfect continuous or the third conditional, nobody's going to die, yeah? And nobody's going to know because you're teaching the doors closed, the headmaster doesn't know. <laughs> And the students will go away and they'll have this fantastic lesson because it was a, built on the conversation. They talked about things that they believe in and like, et cetera. And they'll go home to their father and mother and say, oh, the lesson today was so interesting. And the father and mother will not say to them, but did you practice the present perfect continuous? Amanala, um, have, uh, have I missed? Uh, yes, so yes, that, uh, that was actually a question. Thanks for answering it. And another question is about 
teaching unplug in teaching unplug there are a lot of lesson starter activities are there any for teacher training events uh, uh well i mean this this is a teacher training event but uh extended courses uh i have as some of you will know because you are here have been on my courses maria for example i do run courses online which are more about the principles underlying uh the dogma approach uh but do include reference to the kind of activities that work i mean uh there's a course starting at the end of this month but it's already full uh but if you uh look at international teacher development institute itdi uh they will uh, their website will tell you when the next course is and of course in the days before the pandemic when i used to travel i would do courses uh face to face intensive courses and uh, those days uh may start again we'll see um but yes uh but i mean it's not rocket science it's not like it's a different method it's just using the best of the methods which are consistent with the spirit of language teaching that i've outlined so if you go into communicative approach you look at activities which are truly communicative not just designed to practice a particular grammatical feature a lot of games for example a lot of games a lot of guessing games a lot of what we might call icebreakers or warmers yeah for the beginning of the lesson can actually become the lesson yeah things like for example doing a survey where you know that you've got to use a course book everybody has to use a course book i've always used course books but you can free yourself of the course book so the course book says the topic of the day is um travel uh okay fine so i put the course book aside we're going to find out class who likes to travel who doesn't who's the most traveled person etc i want you to create a questionnaire in groups yeah a survey create your questions write them all down and then you're going to i'm going to reposition you or if 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 possible you're going to move around in the classroom and you're going to ask questions to everybody else in the class or as many people as possible there's a time limit then you're going to go back you're going to listen for the answers then you're going to go back to your group and you're going to collate the answers that you've all collected and then you're going to present to the class a report on what you discovered yeah that's a whole lesson and it's going to generate so much language about travel it's going to generate grammatical stuff like have you ever it's going to uh it's going to provide practice at writing the questions at speaking the questions at listening for the answers at at uh collating the answers and writing the report and presenting the report formally to the rest of the class it's a fan you know you can do that with any topic you can do it about food you can do it about clothing about shopping you can do it about housing there's no limit so that's the kind of thing these are these are not there's nothing new about these activities they've been around forever but what i'm tr trying to suggest is here that rather than be just like optional warming up activities these these activities can become the lesson and because they're focused on the learners lives and experiences they will be arguably more memorable than activities which are simply taken straight out of the course book awesome and next we have mark uh, mark fletcher asking about uh, can dogma approach be utilized for english for industrial training yes i mean and that's a very good question i mean every institution has its own constraints and very few of us as teachers are completely free to do what we want we have to work within institutions and the larger the institution often the more problematic it becomes in terms of standardization so institutions like to know that if all the learners in the a2 classes and there may be 10 of them they like to know that they're all marching to the beat of the same drum yeah so that they're all prepared uh for the exam and that nobody feels that they've been short changed because you know i mean it's very hard to control that uh and one way of controlling it i know some institutions demand that the teachers teach a particular lesson plan on a particular day or a particular unit of the book on a particular day but you know how we interpret those lesson plans and how we interpret the unit, units of books varies enormously from teacher to teacher 
Now, I remember talking to, I overheard a conversation in our teacher's room in Barcelona where two teachers were saying, they're teaching the same level, right? And one of them said to the other, what, are you, what unit are you up to in the book? Yeah. And one of them said, oh, I'm on the unit uh, about money. And the other one said, oh, I'm on the unit about the second conditional. They were talking about the same unit. But one of them saw it from a thematic point of view. And one of them saw it from a purely grammatical point of view. And I suggest that the person saw it from a thematic point of view, perhaps, perhaps was able to create more affordances outside the very narrow curriculum of the second conditional. Because we're going to talk about money. Yeah? We're going to talk about money, who likes it, who has it, who doesn't have it, who wants it, <laughs> why it's good, why it's bad. We're going to have a survey. We're going to talk about our experiences. We're going to brainstorm songs about money. We're going to look at a video, YouTube, about somebody, you know, whatever, thinking about money. Um, and then, by the way, I'll teach you the second condition. I can teach you the second condition in five minutes. It's no big deal, you know. Uh, you won't learn it, but I can teach it to you. But I won't learn it if I spend three quarters of an hour teaching it either. That's another thing about learning. The longer you spend teaching something, the less likely it is that learners will learn it. So five minutes on the second conditional, and then we're going to talk about money. So it is possible within an institution, I think, to kind of standardize, to work from the same materials, to work from the same lesson plans even. Uh, but then you find, you know, you create the opportunities as they come up. You, as an experienced teacher, you are sensitive to things that have come up. You're looking at the students. You're aware of what's boring them, what's interesting them. And you invite them into the lesson to share their experiences, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll, as I say, you'll have greater or lesser degree of freedom depending on your institution. And we talk a lot in this, in this book about what we call dogma moments, is when you seize a moment in the lesson where something happens, a crack opens, and rather than close the crack, you drill down. You say, oh, 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 really? You don't uh, have any money? Tell us about it, etc." So, yeah, I mean, I'm not denying that, as I say, that uh, institutions have constraints and we have to work within them. But as teachers, there are, we do have, you know, we need, to, we need to think about where we have agency in our teaching, at what level. We don't have agency in terms of deciding the textbook or the curriculum or the exams. We don't maybe have agency even in the um, lesson plan, but we do have agency probably in the activities we choose for that lesson plan. And within those activities, we have a degree of agency in how the learners participate. You know, the degree of involvement and participation. Now, this is not easy if you've got a class of 50 uh, 12-year-olds, but it, it's nor is it impossible. But that's the where we have a degree of agency. And we need to explore that we say okay i can't change this i can't change that i can't change the other but i can modify a little bit the way i do tasks and activities in the classroom mm -hmm. wonderful Amanala. and do you think yes do you think uh, dogma will be useful for our language skills and aspects uh, as hassan mahdi sorry do i think who is this i'm just trying to find this What was the question again, Amanala? Uh, well, Hassan Adi asked that, uh, do you think dogma will, will be useful for all language skills and aspects? All language. Or our language, I missed that. Yep. All language aspects. Like, for example, not just grammar reading but, writing ah yeah yeah absolutely yeah. yes yeah. And then i was there was a question further back about uh writing which interested me too about how you are yes absolutely i mean writing uh writing need not be an individual activity it can be a collaborative activity and there's lots and lots of different techniques and ways of doing collaborative writing um 
so for a start, yeah. So where students are collaborating, then they are uh, having to teach each other things. I mean, the dictogloss, for example, the classic dictogloss where they hear a text and they've got to try and reconstruct it from memory, working together is a writing task. I mean, it's a listening task as well, but it is also a writing task and they do that collaboratively. Uh, and there's lots of, as I say, there's lots of activities that are collaborative, but also can focus or can be made to focus on their own experiences and lives and whatever. Uh, when learners are exchanging texts, yeah, writing across the classroom, sending each other letters rather than having uh, a spoken conversation about the weekend or asking questions through an exchange of letters like texting. I mean, that is a writing task and that's purely uh, dogma, if you like. And reading similarly. And I think where learners, are, coming back to this thing of self-directed learners, where learners are encouraged and shown how to find texts outside the classroom, you know, using the internet, if they have access to it. So I want you, for homework, you're going to find a text, an interesting story. Maybe it's a folk story. You can give them some websites. A folk tale from Thailand. But Anna, you can choose whatever country, a folk tale. You're going to present this to your group in the next lesson. Uh, so what are they going to do? They're going to download it and then they're going to look up the words in the dictionary and make sure they understand it because they're going to tell their group the next lesson their story yeah? so they need to understand it so it's a combination of reading research reading language work as they work particularly on the vocabulary using a dictionary and then speaking telling and then of course it's listening for the ones who are listening and that's purely student driven they find the stories not you it's not it doesn't come from the course book it's on the internet and you tell them we want stories i want stories i want you to come next lesson i want you to find out uh about something uh related to the topic of this unit in the book which as we said might be sport i want you to find it five interesting facts about a sport that you're interested in, yeah? And off they go, come back, they tell the other students, etc. There's a lot of reading involved in preparing for that. So, yes, long answer, short question. Yes, I think Dogma totally uh, addresses all the language skills. How are we going, Amanala? Any more? Yes, we're good. And, uh, yes, you wanted to answer a question from the chat. from about, I've lost you. Yes, you are, uh, uh, yes, I'm, uh, I think you wanted to answer someone from the chat. Uh, you thought this, this one is interesting. I, I don't know what question you were talking about. No, no, it was a question about writing, but I, in a sense, I've kind of answered that, uh, mm -hmm. task-based writing. Um, yeah, the task-based teaching generally, there's no, it's not about speaking only. It's also about all the other skills. And the same would be said for dogma. I'm just looking at the last question here from Anna. Um, I'm wondering if I would be able to ask my students what they want to talk about today rather than preparing something myself. Yes, fantastic, Anna. Absolutely. And this is so important. Ask the learners. Yeah, Don't be afraid of asking the learners what it is that they're interested in. Yeah, we do this, I think, perhaps informally, but it might be something that you could do, and not just once, but periodically, because their interests will change, they'll become more sophisticated, they will become more articulated. Uh, and don't be surprised if, for example, all the boys say they want to talk about sport, and all the girls want to talk about whatever. I'm not, I'm being a little bit sexist here, but I mean, it often happens. We can accommodate all interests over time uh but the important thing is that learn show and tell you know that's another classic i used to do that at prim primary school in new zealand a hundred years ago show and tell everybody had to take turns show and tell talk about something they own something uh, uh, tell the rest of the class answer questions i mean you know you can do that online you can do that with adults you can do that with children you can do it with advanced students you can do that with there's no end to it 
Okay, Amanala, I, I sense that we're out of time, um, but thank you everybody for your uh, for being here, uh, for your questions, for your comments, and thank you, Amanala, and Teacher Development Webinars for the great work that you're doing. And I'll say well, goodbye. Thank you so, so much, uh, Scott, uh, for this wonderful talk, taking us to the history, how it started, and uh, where we stand now, and talking about your uh, world-famous dogma approach, teaching unplugged, as uh, also we call it. So yeah, uh, the chat is uh, full of appreciation, and uh, someone mentioned on YouTube chat that they have taken your course on dogma in HITIDI. So I suppose this course is, uh, uh, you know, going to run soon, so I recommend it. Do join the squad there too. And uh, thanks very much for this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you to all of our being with us uh, in this wonderful webinar. If you want certificate for the session, you can email at info.cdwebinars at the rate of gmail.com. For our future webinars, you can register at www.cdwebinars.org. The registration is free and there are no charges for registration. And this talk will also be available at Teacher Development Webinars YouTube channel. Feel free to share with colleagues. And we're available on all our social media channels, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. So yeah, don't forget to join us and on social media to have a future updates for our webinars. Thank you very much for joining. Thanks once again, Scott Thornbury. It was wonderful having you at Teacher Development Webinars.